So maybe Robert, you can just tell the audience who you are and how long you've been in the club, stuff like that. Um, sure. Um, name, my name is Robert James. Um, I've been in the WCA, I guess about three, maybe four years now. I first, I first started, um, uh, uh, um, uh, there was a there was a cancellation on a on a on a trip down the Coulomb and someone contacted me and said, "Look, there's a spot here. Um, we know you don't paddle a whole lot of whitewater, but uh, you know, fairly good experienced paddler. Uh, uh, as long as you're not scared of a little bit of adventure, uh, come on, uh, come on down, try it, and see what happens." Um, so I did and uh, had a great time. Loved it. Uh, met a lot of really interesting people. Um, and uh, 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 stayed, I've, I've stayed with the club now for the last three or maybe even four years. I'm not really sure. Yeah. I've done, done a, a fair number of trips. Um, in fact, that uh, background you see on, on mine, on my, on my camera there, that's actually um, uh, Duo Lakes, which is at the start of the Hart River in the, in the Yukon. Mm -hmm. um, so I've done I've done a fair number of other other trips as well. Most recently, the heart or, or sorry, no, that's that's not the heart rather. That's the the, the, the snake river. Um, so the uh, snake, the heart, uh, a lot of a lot of um, um, uh, rivers in sort of central Canada. Uh, Zemoine, the Coulonge, um, the Bonaventure, which is a trip that I oh. led. Uh, 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 last June, um, my my first oh. attempt to actually lead a trip. And um, uh, it was a great experience, and I'd love to do, and I'm looking forward to doing a whole lot more. Yeah, it's right here. All right. Um, so uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks, thanks for tuning in. Um, this, is, this is all about the, um, the title is uh, Bon Aventure in the Gaspé region of Quebec. This is, this is a story about um, uh, paddling the Bonaventure River, uh, which is located in the Gaspé Z. And it'll also describe some sort of related travels uh, that we did there. Um, so a few years ago, I don't, don't know if you guys remember, but Sandra Wiener gave a really fantastic presentation of a trip he did in 2019. Um, since that date, uh, a number of things have happened that change the logistics and character of the trip. So in this presentation, I'll repeat a lot of information describing what you'll find on the river and provide an update on what's changed and how this has affected the river and logistics in planning the trip. Um, I'll also describe some of the things you can do in the Gas Bay area while you're there. Um, before I start, uh, I'd like to acknowledge our recognition for the custodians of the land we're traveling through. Um, Isa, if you got a, um, Isa prepared a bunch of uh, uh, some really beautiful words. I'd like her to share them if possible. Oh, that's very kind of you, Robert. Um, so I just wanted to begin by saying the participants in this. So I was on this trip. Um, so I'm speaking for us all here. Um, the participants in this adventure all live in the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, Neutral, and Anishinaabe. And in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we try to learn a little bit about Indigenous peoples wherever we go. So our adventure here took place in the Mi'kmaq which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people who have lived there for the last 10,000 years or so, and a trust will be there for another 10,000. Mi'kmaq encompasses the Gaspé Peninsula, the Atlantic provinces, and the northeastern region of Maine. Mi'kmaq means friends, and we are all bound by the treaties of peace and friendship signed by the British crown in the 1700s. And they're, they're called the treaties of the peace, of peace and friendship. And these were held as valid by the Supreme Court of Canada in 1999. Took a while. Riviere Bonaventure tumbles down the rocky slopes of the Chicxulub Mountains and flows southward into the Bay de Chaleur, which defines the southern edge of the Gaspé Peninsula. The shores of Chaleur Bay are currently home to the Listigouche and the Gascapiquiach, two of the three surviving Indigenous Mi'kmaq communities in the Gaspé. Mi'kmaq speak a version of Algonquian just like the Anish Anishinaabe nations, and uh, they are trying hard to keep their language alive. You can find the websites. The Mi'kmaq have a record of being experienced and successful treaty makers along their trade routes and fishing and hunting grounds. 
They even got on with the French when they arrived, but they had a lot of trouble over the, the centuries getting the British crown and their settlers to respect their agency and hold on to the spirit of their treaties. So just five years ago, Nova Scotia granted a formal apology and their second ever posthumous pardon to Mi'kmaq Grand Chief Gabrielle Silliboy, who had been tried and convicted of hunting out of season in 1929. So I said he was a second ever posthumous pardon. Do you know who was granted the first ever posthumous pardon? Viola Desmond, the lady gracing her $10 bill. So these gestures signify a change in the way we remember and teach our future. Well, Ali, thank you. Thank you, Isidore. Um, before I start talking about the planning and logistics, um, I wanted to kind of give you a taste of the river so you know whether you'd have any further interest um, and maybe whet your appetite for uh, to, to stick through some of the discussions which are going to be coming up on logistics and stuff. And maybe you'll even be uh, inclined to pay attention to logistics and want to see and uh, see the region for yourself. Um, so without further ado, this is uh, one of the one of the rapids on the Bonaventure it looks like. Okay, so so basically, what normally happens when you're planning planning this trip um, is that um, you make your way to the town of Bonaventure, which is located here. Um, then there was a, there's a, a an outfitter called uh, Sim Avancer. Um, they provide um, uh, uh, trip information and outfitting to to various to various adventures on the Bonaventure River. And one of the things they were they were providing is um, uh, campsite and cabin rentals at Sim and Bonaventure, which is down here. And they also provide shuttle service to get up to start at Black Bonaventure, which is up here. Um, and, and, and this has been going on for years and, and, the, and that relationship has been a pretty good success. Um, uh, it's changed, it's changed a lot recently and I'll be talking about that in the next slide. But what happens then is that you make your way down from this, from the start of the Bonaventure, uh, from Black Bonaventure, um, uh, through uh, various sections. Um, the river is kind of divided up into three sections. Uh, the starting bit is kind of uh, fairly shallow. Um, lots of uh, R1, R12 um, rapids. There's a lot of log jams and sweepers. Um, you come through there into the canyon section where there's some class two and three ledges, some additional rapids. And this is actually a really fun, beautiful section. Um, and you come out of there into what, what I'm calling, referring to here as section three, which is basically kind of a nice, fast, easy, fun cruise. Um, the, the, the reason it's fast is that the Bond Adventure has its origins in the Shikshok Mountains in the, in the, in the heart of Gaspé Z, which are sort of located around here. And I'll show you better maps a bit later. Um, and the river flows south into the Bay de Chaleur, which is, which is down here, which is, which is connected to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, a little bit of stats, you, you're, you're covering a total of about 127 kilometers. Um, the river, in that space, the river drops 417 meters, which is a fair bit, 3.3 meters per kilometer. And if you look at the elevation profile on the bottom there, you can see that it's a pretty continuous drop. Um, uh, more so at the start, where the water, where you're coming out of the mountains and the water is very, very fast. Um, and this trip is typically done over about five or six days. 
Um, you can probably do it in four if you really want to rush, but why would you? Um, a lot of people do it in five days. We ended up taking six just to be able to enjoy the sights and sounds of the river and the beauty that we found there. Um, so now I, I said this is how it, it, was, it was organized in the past. Um, Sandra Wiener gave a fantastic presentation back in 2019. And since that date, uh, a number of things have happened that change logistics and character of the river. And this is something I mentioned a little bit earlier. And, and basically what happened is, or the starting point of this was that um, in the winter of uh, November, December-ish 2020, there was um, severe weather events. There was a lot of rain, there was a lot of snow, there was a lot of, a, a lot of ice was coming down. Um, and this created um, significant flooding, significant damage to the trees in the forests. And what happened is that this brought down a lot of trees. And then these trees, as they came down the river, as they, as they came down out of the mountains, they, 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 they clogged up the river and created, created these huge log jam piles. Now, normally what happens at this point is that in the spring, uh, I remember I mentioned before that uh, Simma Van uh, they provide guiding services onto the river. And, what, and normally at the start of the season, they would send their guides down um, through, through, through a couple, a couple of uh, consecutive trips. And, then, and these guides would clear out all the, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the trees that have come down and basically open up the river and create a pathway for paddlers to come, basically in service of their clients. Um, but I think you then COVID came along. You turned down, don't you? What's it's that? It's awfully hot in here. Oh. Got a lot of wood in there. Yeah. Um, uh, so, and then, and then, then uh, COVID came along, and with COVID, um, there, there, there were no trips, so uh, the guides didn't come through and clear it. So they, so things started to pile up. And in fact, they piled up over over two years. Um, uh, when once COVID started to ease up, and the restrictions started to ease up a fair bit, um, there were staff um, uh, shortages. Um, Sim no longer had the guides available to be able to run these trips, and so they stopped providing, and they, so they, 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 their guides weren't, weren't coming through anymore. Um, the, there were additional problems. Um, there's kind of a, a, a trinity of, thing, of things happening. At the same time, you got to realize that the Bonaventure River is used heavily by salmon fishermen. Um, in fact, it's one of the main economic drivers in the, in the area. So there's a lot of uh, fishing camps along the river. Um, and, and, these, and these people typically value their privacy and their quiet and their fishing time. And so when they see other people coming down their river, um, they're not super happy because it kind of disturbs them. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing that was going on too was that Sim was, was sending people down the river that didn't really have a whole lot of experience necessarily, at least some of them. So some people would come would come down um, and they would and they would uh, crash out, um, uh, canoes get wrecked. Um, the uh, the uh, the lodges operating the fishing camps were were often sort of called upon to to help out um, to 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 to, uh, to rescue stranded uh, paddlers, and frankly, they were getting really irritated and annoyed that. To the extent that that, that they, they started engaging lawyers to try and to restrict the ac access to the river and and try and try and maintain the commercial use of the river strictly for themselves, um, this caused a lot of problems. Obviously, some businesses ended up shutting down. Um, there were lawsuits. Sims' response was to stop uh, operations to the upper part of the river. So Sim doesn't do that anymore. Um, so if we have to find, if we have to get out, get, if you want to do this trip, we had to find an alternate um, uh, service and people willing to do shuttles. So um, enter um, uh, Eskimer. I made uh, a lot of calls um, and uh, I found uh, after calling about 20 to 30 different uh, commercial organizations, including uh, um, uh, pretty much every lodge that was available, the chambers of commerce, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, people in stores trying, trying to get access or trying to find someone that would be willing to be doing a shuttle. I stumbled across Eskimo Adventures and Eskimo 
is an outdoor adventure company based out of St. Andy Mall up north. And I, I convinced them to look into the prospects. And they checked with their insurance and a bunch of other things. And they finally agreed to uh, start operating a shuttle service into Lac Bonaventure. So we were happy about that and we took advantage of it. So we went, we drove to Bonaventure. Um, we got Eskimo to pick us up there and then and drive us up into the put-in with our canoes. Um, if you notice on that from, the, from that map, um, there's uh, the roads there uh, are very, very small. It's uh, uh, a lot of uh, forested uh, logging roads there and some of them are in very, very poor shape. Um, as, we're, as we're driving in with a shuttle, we had the, the shuttle vehicle had to keep on stopping and we would get out, um, cut down some of the trees that were, that were blocking the path. Uh, there were some major ruts. Um, there was there was a section where we had to uh, went through went through kind of a, a river crossing. Uh, water was a little over a foot deep. Um, you could do this yourself if you want to, but four by four is absolutely required. Anyway, uh, but we got there, and then we started. We were able to start our trip. So, um, first section, I mentioned before um, that. Um, well, the river starts off, it's uh, fairly shallow and it winds fairly easily uh, down through so the mountain forest regions. Um, it's fast. Um, Water is moving here at about 10 kilometers an hour as it comes out of the Shikshok Mountains. There's lots of easy um, class R1 and R12 rapids along, uh, along the way. But be aware that this is fairly shallow. Um, so you do have to have to watch out for rocks. And that sort of limits the availability of, of this river because the season is fairly short. And I'll come to that a bit later. Um, one thing you should note, you should also note though, that because this is a mountain river, and if you remember the elevation profile is pretty steady. Um, around Ontario and Quebec, we're kind of used to more of a, a pool and drop style where there's where there's a drop, and then at the end of the drop, there's kind of a kind of a big uh, uh, a small lake area um, and you can stop in that lake to be able to assess the carnage and uh, recollect yourselves and then keep on going. Water here is flowing continuously. There's very few opportunities to, uh, there's very few eddies to be able to stop in safely and easily, um, which has some safety implications. Um, if, you do if you do flip here, it could be a long swim. And the other re related point is that if something in your, in your boat goes overboard, um, chances are you're not, get, you're not getting it back. So um, we started we start paddling down through this region. Um, the campsites, at least in this area, um, not great. Um, and sometimes a little bit hard to find. Um, and as the, as the log jams come through and as the, with all the damage to the forest, uh, some of them become inaccessible or obscured due to the blowdowns. Um, in fact, we wanted to stop uh, before we started hitting the major blowdown section. Um, we did find this campsite. It wasn't great, but it was serviceable. There's actually a better one a little bit further down. Um, I can give you coordinates of our campsites and stuff if you contact me uh, through the WCA a little bit later on. Um, but uh, this section is nice. There's lots of easy R1s and R2s or R1 to 2. Um, as we're coming down this river, remember this river is still moving fast. Um, every now and then we'll um, have to do a quick emergency stop. Um, a lot of trees in the way. Remember I was, I was mentioning the log jams and blowdowns. Um, many of these are going all the way across the river. Um, you do have to do kind of an emergency stop and we would jump out. We kept, we kept our saws handy and we cut our way through some of these trees. And we ended up clearing in this section, I think there were about six trees that we, that we worked our way through in order to clear a path for ourselves and also for uh, future paddlers. Um, don't, this is probably good to take, we took care of most of the work for this season, although the next season was probably gonna be a whole lot more. Um, so, and, and part, of, part of this, I guess, is because Sim wasn't doing their, wasn't bringing the guides through anymore. Um, no one else has, has responsibility for clearing the river. So paddlers are kind of uh, doing it for themselves. Um, so keep on going. The, um, um, there's getting into more and more log jams. And at some, at some point, the river starts to get really clogged up. 
Um, and what tends to happen is that um, the uh, trees get thrown. Get the, the, there's so many trees get thrown into into the into the water that it basically spreads the water out, um, and the river starts to create new paths through the forest. Um, and so the river gets uh, gets divided into a collection of very small creeks, and you have to kind of navigate these creeks. Um, in fact, at one point, um, well, we even we even used a drone for scouting. Um, here's here's a couple of shots showing uh, some of the creeks that were that were going through, um, passing underneath uh, one of the logs that was fortunately a little bit high. Uh, kind of, it was pretty big for us to cut. Um, you do eventually make it, and when you get through on the other side, you come through into absolutely stunningly beautiful crystal clear water. Um, it's it's it feels Mediterranean um, other than the water temperature. So, so now we come, um, if, we've, if we've got through all the log jams, we come into a section they refer to as the canyon. Um, the, we're in, in this part here, the water is sort of recollected and confined to a narrow route. And the water now speeds up and it runs over, it's almost continuous R1 to 2 rapids, um, and then pours over uh, some class 2 and 3 ledges with a few additional R2, 3 rapids at the end. Um, note that these rapids and ledges are mostly runnable. Um, some of the ledges were lined, uh, where, where it looks like the water level was a little bit lower, was a little bit sketchy. Um, but there are no mandatory portages, which is which is kind of nice. Imagine a, imagine a six day trip with no portaging. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, this is just a bit of a clip. actually fairly typical for for what for one of the R2s. Um, uh, fun, um, a little bit of a challenge, but nothing, but nothing particularly dangerous. Um, as we come through a lot of sections of these sort of R1s in, in, in R2 sections, we come across, we come into the heart of the canyon. Um, in this point here, this is this is a shot taken from straight above using my drone. Um, the what you see let me, let me bring my, my uh, laser pointer back on. Um, this is one of the class three ledges. There's a section here where there's two class three ledges in a row. This is the second of those. As we come through here and you come down, you find that if you can pay enough attention and be aware of it, if you can stop right around here on this side of this bend, there's an absolutely stunning uh, campsite. And it's, very, it's a well-maintained campsite. It's a little bit high on a, on a, on a, on a ridge here. Uh, you don't see it easily from the water, so you have to pay attention. But this is actually one of the most beautiful campsites on the river. Um, now, from this campsite, there's a trail which runs around the side out through this way and going, going down the river. Um, and this trail can be used to scout the, the R23, which is coming up, and, and another class three ledge. Um, and if you, if, if basically depending on what you see on that scouting trip and the water levels, um, if what you see doesn't make you inclined to uh, uh, have some fun on the water, you can also use the same trail to portage. Um, I'll also note that, that from, the, from the view of this campsite here, there's a really nice view of a beautiful waterfall right across the way in here, which is kind of begging to be explored. We didn't have a chance to get to it because it was kind of raining uh, that, that afternoon. But uh, I recommend other people do it in the future. Um, when you when you take down this trail uh, on th at the other end of the trail, which is down here, and you have a really great spot uh, for turning around and watching people come down through these rapids 
and it's a great spot to stop and uh, uh, handle the um, um, uh, a throw rope for some of the carnage which is likely to ensue from people people are running it. <laughs> So this is what the rapid looked like. The, the, this is the rapid, by the way, that I showed at the at the start of the presentation. Um, it's actually uh, kind of fun, a little bit challenging. Um, if you look at the angle of that canoe there, you get a feel for, for what that ledge is really like. Um, and uh, uh, carnage is almost guaranteed, <laughs> uh, at least for some for some of the boats. Um, one of the things that we were kind of mystified by is that if you look at that lower picture. Um, when this canoe flipped, it managed to stick bullet two paddles uh, in the water. Um, and they got lodged in rocks. I don't know if you can see them. I mean, there they are. Not sure exactly how this happened. Can you point to now. it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I figured that was fun. Um, at the at the end of the canyon, um, as we're coming out of it, there's still a few more ledges here. And going to the next section, there's still a few R12s. There's a couple of R2 rapids, but there's no more R3. Um, so the hard stuff is now done at this point. Um, the next section, uh, now the river starts opening up. Um, the final section is characterized by smart, by smooth, fast flowing water and very few rapids. Um, log jams have been left far behind at this point. And, but an important note though, um, kilometer 72, which is around here, uh, marks the start of road access. Uh, before this point, there are no emergency services. There's no, there's no way to get a vehicle in. But uh, from, from this point on, uh, this is where the fishing camps start um, and they start have ac and they have access uh, through, through, through roads. Um, the, the junction with the, the west branch of the Bonaventure, the, it's what they call the, the, the uh, Bonaventure West on the maps, um, is basically the start of the fishing areas. Um, water gets deeper and runs and runs clear. Um, and this is uh, the, the, uh, the alternate put in for people that are paddling just the, the lower section of the river. Um, so as we come down through this section, we start seeing signs of civilization in the forms of the fishing camps. For the for the local salmon industry, um, this is what that water looks like. It's beautiful. It's as beautiful as it looks. It's worth it's worth taking some time here to actually to actually enjoy the water as we're seeing it. Um, few few rapids still still left over. Mainly R ones. Might be a few R twos still, but uh, uh, nothing that can't be lined pretty easily. Now, I was mentioning the fishing camps. Um, as we're coming down, we see a lot of fishing camps are looking sort of like the ones up on the, in the, in the upper picture. Um, fishermen, fishermen there, uh, for the most part, um, they're sitting in boats. And if you look at that boat in the uh, uh, lower left, um, it's kind of a, a, an odd shaped boat because um, it has two seats in it. It almost feels like something out of the Victorian era. era. Uh, where, they, where, where, where you see a person sitting upright on a chair uh, with, their, with, with their fishing rod. Um, one, th one thing to be, be aware of, as I mentioned earlier, there is some sensitivity about sharing of the, of the, of the river between the salmon fishermen and the, and the, and the remainder of the river users. Um, we just ask everybody to try and, try and be a good neighbor. Um, you know, be, be respectful of the fishermen and of, and of what they're trying to do. Uh, stay well clear of their lines, if, we, if at all possible. Um, you know, uh, nod, say hi as you're, as you're, as you're going by, greet, greet people. They, 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 they generally will, will greet you back. Um, we not only see people in boats, we also see uh, some of the banks sometimes are kind of lined with these salmon fishermen doing, uh, doing uh, fly fishing. Um, at one point on the towards the bottom of the river. Now this is this was our uh, uh, last camp. This is at kilometer 22. So we're 22 kilometers from the from the ocean at this point. Um, there is a picnic area which is maintained by uh, Sim Avanceur, um, and they and they use this as a picnic stop on for their for, for, for their day trips. 
Now, uh, the camp itself or the, the picnic area is kind of their property and their, and their maintenance and stuff. But the, um, uh, the area below that on, on the water is, is still is considered public and it's fair game for camping. So we, we took advantage of that. Um, while we were there, uh, the guides from Sim came by and said hello and waved and said, no problem, you know, enjoy yourselves. That was, that was great. But the other good thing about that point, it's also um, a base for a hiking trail network. So if you want to sort of mix things up and go on a hike, um, I dug out, I used the All Trails app. And on this app, uh, I was able to find a network of trails. Um, our camp and that point on the river, kilometer 22, is shown here where my, my laser pointer is highlighting it. Um, we, we tried to jo join the trail this way. Uh, this river at the time, that, that stream there, uh, was blocked. It was overflowing. Uh, couldn't get through it. Uh, we, found, we found a trail to go this way and connected into this hiking trail. Um, this is basically kind of an ATV or a skidoo trail, at least, at least for a part of it. Um, it's, it's even marked as uh, road number 10 or trail 10, whatever that means, whatever, whatever, whatever signpost the, uh, that corresponds to. Um, and, this, and this goes for about uh, two or three kilometers. And if you follow it far enough, you will eventually see a turnoff for uh, um, uh, uh, White Creek uh, waterfalls. And there's, and there's two beautiful waterfalls here. There's the Chutes de Risseau Blanc, and a little bit further down, about a kilometer further away, it's the Chutes de Risseau Creux. So um, total, that, that distance there is about eight kilometers uh, round trip. Um, uh, probably about three or four hours. It's a, it's, it's a half day's hike. Uh, highly recommend it. It is beautiful. So uh, this is the start of the trail network. You will note, though, that the trails aren't visible from the river. Um, you do have to stop at that picnic area, uh, go, uh, go, go up the bank then before you start to find it. Um, and this is what the waterfall looks like. When you come up the trail, you, the trail starts off at, you see a little bridge across the river and there's a little, a little, little hut to be able to stop and look over the waterfalls. Um, when you go down the other side of it, this is, this is what you get. And you can see the hut up here. It's stunningly beautiful waterfall. Uh, we spent a little bit of time there, kind of enjoying it. Um, why don't you continue is another kilometer away to the, the a second waterfall, which is apparently even more beautiful. Um, we we kind of ran out of time. We end up spending too much time here, just relaxing and enjoying ourselves. We didn't get get end up getting around to see it. But for the next people that go through, um, I'd love for them to come back and report and show me pictures. So 20, 20 kilometers or fifteen kilometers later on. Um, is the takeout. Uh, now, there's a few options for takeout. Um, the default option is that there's a takeout point right at Sim Avance. Sim, Sim uh, has, has a dock, and you can pull your, pull your boat out right at that dock and then and, uh, portage your, 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 your canoe a couple hundred feet uh, back, back to, the, back to uh, where, where you have your cars, uh, hopefully in a parking lot. Um, but there are other options. You can continue, uh, continue downriver. Uh, all the way through here. And it's kind of cool to actually come out onto the Atlantic Ocean. So this, this comes out into Bay de Chaleur and you have an option of coming through here. You can stop um, at the, um, uh, there's a marina here and the marina has a boat ramp and you can stop there at that boat ramp and bring and take your butt out. Or a lot of people, if you're, if you're feeling adventurous, um, you can come out past the, past the breakwater. There's a nice big lighthouse here. Um, you can go around the lighthouse um, and then surf the tides into the beach. There's a beach right there. Um, this will mean that you've got about a 200 meters or so portage to bring your canoes and gear back to your cars, which are gonna be in here somewhere. But um, suggested to, to come, out of the, come out of the marina, but um, just mainly because the, the route is a bit confusing in coming through here, but uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a fun experience. So feel free. Um, there, there, I, I would also say that because here you're on the Atlantic Ocean, um, you, as you're coming through this area, you really have to be careful about gauging the weather. 
uh, if, if that water is rough on here, you're going to have a hard time crossing here. You're going to be going parallel to the waves. Um, then you've got to cross and do a, do a 180. So there is some additional danger there. Be careful if you're going to do that. Um, Just to mention that spit is all campgrounds and you can uh, you know have a yeah. trailer there and all kind of stuff like that or yeah. just like yeah, this all, this all campgrounds here yeah and a parking so there's all facilities yeah. there to park and camp and whatever so that's basically the river um i'll talk a little bit about some logistics when uh when to go where where it is how to get there costs um i mentioned the trip logistics or the trip duration already um I showed before this historical flow, and you saw what that what that peak flow was like in twenty uh, 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 December of twenty twenty. But but if you take a look at the way the the uh, the flow works, um, there is a significant peak in mid May, and this is this is the height of the the, the, the spring flood. Um, if you try to go through here, the water is basically unmanageable. Uh, just way way too fast. Uh, you're not you're it'll, it'll be it'll be disastrous. It'll be, it's not safe. Um, there, as, as, that, as that level drops, there is a window of time um, from about uh, early to mid-June until roughly the start of July or maybe the first or at, at most the second week of July. And this is really your season where, the, where that water is navigable. Um, our trip uh, was, this is the time, time here, 10 to 17th of June, where the, the water flow was on the order of about 50 to 60 uh, cubic meters per second, um, and that was actually kind of optimum. Um, but with the water, if the water level would have dropped much more than that, if you remember the early shots where the water was fairly shallow and we ended up walking a fair bit and uh, and, and lining some of the some of the ledges, um, if the water dropped much more, uh, you'd be walking or portaging through a lot of that a lot of those sections. So there is a very definite window. Yeah, I think Sid um, told us 55 is the magic number. Okay. Yeah, and that's kind of uh, roughly where we're at. We're, we're, we're probably even slightly above that. So that, yeah. that was perfect. We, yeah, we had, we had really good water for this. Yeah, we did too. Um, how to get there? There's basically three options. Um, you can drive there. It's a long drive. I'll show it in a minute. You can take a train and the train will bring you into Matapedia. Or you can even fly if you really want to. Um, we didn't investigate the flying option, but um, just to give you a sense of scale here, uh, Toronto is here. Um, there's Montreal and Quebec City. Um, the Bonaventure River, uh, the, the starting point is here, and you're basically shuttling and paddling through this, this part of it here. Um, the train goes to here. This is this is Matapedia. Um, there's an airport here. Looks like that, 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 that point has moved a bit, but it's, uh, it's at uh, Montjoly. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to drive, um, from Toronto, it's about 14 hours from Ottawa, it's about 11. Um, most people will drive it across in about two days and you can take a break probably to the Quebec city or else Ramouski around in here. Um, take one long day and maybe a short, a short, a, 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 then a second shorter day to be able to come in through here. Um, if you take a train or the, or the flight, then you've got to find a way to have someone pick you up or rent a car to be able to come into Bonaventure. But, but that's all possible. It just depends on you know, your, your accommodations and what you're willing to do. Um, I'll, I'll mention quickly the costs. Um, uh, they do rent canoes at SIM, at least they, at least they used to. I don't know. Uh, since they stopped providing services to the top part of the river, whether they'll allow you to take their canoes up there, it's not certain to have to confirm. But when they were renting, you're looking at about 60 bucks a day per canoe. Um, so we'll figure out what that cost is. Uh, the cost of the shuttle, when we went through Eskimo Adventure, our cost, we paid 920 bucks. It's pretty pricey, but that shuttle is about four hours first or three and a half to about four or four and a half hours depending on how much time you spend uh, uh, along the road uh, cut, cutting down the uh, deadfalls and stuff. Um, there was another option. We contacted uh, some of the staff at the Zach, um, Zach Bonaventure. The Zach is um, the equivalent of the local um, land management office 
uh, zone explo exploitation contrôlée, I think is uh, what, their, what the acronym stands for. Um, we did find someone there that was willing to drive us. But then when we came across Eskimer, we figured, okay, well, um, Eskimer is a, a commercial organization. They have insurance, they have, they'll provide a guarantee. Um, and we wanted to use them to foster a more professional guiding service and start that as a commercial enterprise for the benefit of uh, future paddlers coming through the area. Um, in any event, uh, the Zex staff quoted us the same price. So there was, there's, there's, there's no savings and a lot of disadvantages in doing with Zex. Um, accommodations, we stayed at Sim, as I mentioned, we rented two cabins and we spent 800 bucks total for about two nights for six people. Um, there's also option there for camping. Uh, the cabins, by the way, are beautiful. They're, 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 they're beautiful, they're kind of rustic, but they're, but they're really nice and they have a lot of space inside for um, organizing gear and stuff at the start and end of the trip. Um, transportation uh, depends a lot on, there's several different classes of train fare that you can take advantage of. Um, vehicle costs will depend a lot on the vehicle, the number of people in the vehicle. We budgeted nominally about 150 bucks per person for the gas. So once you include all of those things, um, I'll exclude excluding transport, we're only paying about 260 bucks a person, probably about 400 by the time you throw the transport in plus food. So this is not an expensive trip to do. Um, um, additional costs, I guess there's probably some meals um, and maybe a night stay on, on the way if you're not camping. Yeah. But I never, I never you, found meals because you got to eat anyways. Yeah, you gotta eat anyway. Yeah, so. Um, it's a long drive. As I said, from Toronto, it's like 14 hours. So while you're there, it's worth spending a little bit of time to explore uh, explore the area because it's a beautiful, stunning area. Um, what I, what, um, I forgot what I was gonna say here. Um, yeah, uh, when you look at this uh, like a standard map, this, this is from, from a Google map or Google Earth, you don't really see a whole lot of what's available. Um, but what we wanted to do was, um, some of us did, did, did a trip, we went from Bonaventure, uh, where, we, where we came off and we did a, a road trip all the way around through the perimeter, uh, through Perse, uh, Fodillon, um, coming back through here into saint anne des -Mont. Um, and from Saint Anne de Mo went down into the gas into the uh, Parc de la Gaspésie, and then stopped in at Bic, which is here on the way out. Um, but this doesn't really show a whole lot. So instead, take a look at um, the the roadmap, and here you see the 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 the, the, the expanse represented by the Parc de la Gaspésie, um, and it shows you gives you an idea of a lot of more options to do in the area. Um, if you're looking for things to do, if you've paddled the, the Bonaventure and still have a, have a hankering for more paddling, uh, the Cascapedia River is almost next door. Uh, that'll give you uh, three or four days of additional whitewater if you want to organize that trip. Um, there's a lot of, the, the, uh, the whole coast along here is full of really tiny but very touristy towns and the roads are in fantastic shape. It's a great opportunity for doing cycle touring in the right season. And, and, and frankly, you're going to be there in June, June and July. It's a perfect time for it. It's beautiful. Um, there's a lot of options for hiking. Um, the the, the, uh, the Shikshok Mountains in the middle um, in, in, in this region, um, there's about a dozen peaks there, which are over a thousand meters high. Um, there's a network of huts in here, uh, which, can be, which can be rented. They're backcountry huts. And you can and you can do a, a hike from hut to hut to hut all the way through this entire region and through here. Um, there is the uh, there's a network of trails around Fodion in here. Um, the whole section is actually combined by the International Appalachian Trail. Um, I'll come to that in a, in, a, in a sec, but this gives you some a lot of opportunities. Um, that same network of trails in the Shekshoks. And the same huts can also be used for uh, for, uh, for doing a hut to hut skiing, um, and you can and you can arrange a, a tour here of about ten days long, or or anywhere from two to up, up to about ten days uh, con con consecutive hut to hut touring. Um, also within the within the park here, you can arrange trips for doing canyoning, 
um, out around Fodion, there's a lot of sea kayaking. There are so much many other things to do in this area. It's just a, it's just a paradise for outdoor adventures lovers. Um, a little bit of detail on the Parc de la Gaspésie. Um, first, the first thing I'll, I'd, I'd, I'd mentioned is that I, I referred to the International Appalachian Trail a bit earlier. And if you don't know, the Appalachian Trail um, starts down in Georgia, um, then travels about 3,500 kilometers and ends at uh, Bangor, Maine. Um, and Maine is just, well, actually, it's not, it's not shown on here, but uh, in here, I guess if you look at this map, um, they, someone, someone uh, made a point of realizing that the, the Shikshok Mountains are actually an, uh, an early extension of the Appalachians. So they decided to extend the Appalachian Trail into Canada and they created the International Appalachian Trail, which comes from um, Maine, where the Appalachian Trail ends, comes up through here, um, uh, crosses through the Parc de la Gaspésie, which is which is this network here, and runs through the, 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 the this trail network with all these huts, um, and comes out and hits the coast and goes along to Fodion. Um, it stops there temporarily. You've got to take a ferry or find some way to get into PEI. Then it continues and goes wanders through here, Nova Scotia, then up to the tip of Newfoundland. Um, if you wanted to do the whole thing, that'd be a kind of a cool, very cool adventure. But the reason I wanted to show this was that the, the, this network of huts is absolutely spectacular. These mountains here, there are many of them are above tree line. Um, so you have fantastic views, great skiing, great hiking. Um, if you're going to go in there, book the cabins early. Uh, they do fill up fast, but there's also lots of campsites available. I will also say that at the time that you're there, um, some of the peaks in this region are closed and these trails are closed. Uh, this is the mating season for the local caribou herd. So they block out the trails until the 1st of July. Um, just, to, just to finish off, there's a few shots of what, the, what some of these parks and areas look like. Uh, these are the, this is the Shikshoks. This is, this is a view from uh, one of the, close to one of the summits, uh, Mont Zalibou. Uh, you can see that we're, we're well above tree line here. Uh, La Cascapedia, if, you're, if you want to take a break, rent a cabin within the park at the, at the lower elevations, um, beautiful and relaxing areas as well. Um, took advantage of the opportunity to do some canyoning, uh, had a great time, a lot of fun. As we started uh, driving, uh, we came to Per Se, and Per Se is known for Per Se Rock. Um, kind of iconic, very well known, but the town of Per Se itself is also a, a, a beautiful little touristy town. It's definitely worth seeing on your own, especially if you're coming through there um, as part of a cycle tour or something, it'd be absolutely fantastic. It's a, a, a nice little town, a great spot to come through and kind of hang out and wander. They have lots of little small festivals and things going on there too. Um, and if you take the time, but just in behind the, the town, there's a, there's a beautiful little grotto. It's kind of worth exploring, it's beautiful. If you keep on going, you come into Fodio. This is uh, Land's End, which is uh, the furthest point of uh, that part of East, the mainland Eastern Canada. Uh, I could use the word stunning um, to describe the scenery over and over and over. It doesn't get tired, uh, mainly because it's probably the easiest way to describe it. Anyway, I invite you to venture for yourself. Um, while we're while we're sort of wandering through Fodio, we actually saw more wildlife there than we ever did on the on the Bonaventure River itself. A moose, bear, uh, lots of seals while we're kayaking. And this brings up to the final our final stop was at Bick. Uh, Bick is a it's a, a provincial park. Um, just on the uh, western side of Rabuski, uh, as you're as you're as you're coming home. 
And that is it. Questions? I see there's a couple of uh, chats, a couple of things in the chat. I'd be happy to take questions. I guess you can go back to, um, you know, people mode, and then we could uh, see people asking the questions and whatever. Sure, if I can figure out how. Yeah. Robert, one of the questions is, what's canyoning? <laughs> what is canyoning? Um, canyoning is, imagine a canyon. Okay, um, there's a, a cleft between rocks, uh, typically water flowing through. Uh, there is uh, a lot of waterfalls, uh, uh, rapids. Uh, this wouldn't be navigable. It's not big enough to be navigable, but it is fun to just uh, 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 walk through, walk uh, 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 through, through, through the rocks, through the water. Um, often involves a lot of rappelling because uh, the waterfalls are pretty steep. Um, but uh, basically, if you look at the picture from canyoning, you'll that should give you a pretty good idea what it looks like. Um, there, there's me coming coming down the waterfall here, working my way down uh, on our on our rappel line, um, and we basically slid down through through all this all all this all, all this this uh, little ravine full of, full of water. It was a great time. Very adventurous. Very fun. Excellent. Now, how do I stop? I'm trying to stop sharing here. Yeah, just uh, I think the arrow is way down at the bottom there somewhere. Yep. There we go. There we go. All right. If anybody has any questions, they could just unmute themselves and jump right in, I guess, and ask your question. Robert, I was just a uh, great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciated it. We were thinking of doing this uh, river ourselves. Uh, and uh, I wanted to get your opinion on the three sections of the river. If you skipped the top section, which we are planning on skipping to avoid the shallow water and the, and the log jams, would that significantly uh, reduce the uh, pleasure on the trip? Um, I think so. Um, the, it, you can't really skip section one without also skipping section two. Um, there's a, there's an access point at the start at Lac Bonaventure. Then the next access point would be um, close to the, uh, the 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 junction with the Bonaventure West. So you can, there's no access in between, as far as I can tell. So um, the at at, the, at this point for future rivers, chances are other people would have gone through it and taken out a lot of the a lot a lot of the log jams. And frankly, the log jams are fun. Um, you do have to pay attention. You have to be prepared to make to make uh, to, to, to stop uh, at a moment's notice when you when you see the when you when you see the things there. Uh, be careful about following too close behind because if someone has to stop, you have to stop as well, and hopefully you don't run into them. But um, it, it's it's still fun. Um, that section of the river, as long as you've got water, um, it's fast. Um, a lot of easy rapids, uh, easy R ones, R one two, nothing technical. Uh, it'd be just fun, fun to uh, push through. So yeah, I'd, I'd recommend doing the whole thing. If you if you were to skip, if you really wanted to skip that, you'd end up missing the canyon, and that's just the most beautiful yeah. part. Yeah, that um, was my that was my question. It, 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 I thought you could skip section one and still do two and three, but if you skip one, you're you're starting and just doing three. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and also the canyon, like when you do it at the 50, 60 zone. The couple ledges that are, you know, class two or class three, I would actually classify them at about two and a half. They're not a full three, you know, they're just like a, a blip, but you know, that would be my classification. I, yeah. you know, I personally, I did wipe out on one of them, but it's because we were the first down, we didn't know where we we're going. Um, but I would say it's max two and a half. Yeah, the, 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 you can portage around everything. Yeah. Well, either, either, either line. you can yeah. around the around those ones, or, or you can line almost everything. So there's there's easy ways of getting out. Um, yeah. It's it's not a scary road. river. It's just uh you know the class one slash two. It's like you're going down this the you know the river's only as wide as a road, and there's like rocks everywhere, but they're kind of roundy rocks, and you can kind of bobble through them. It's like a pinball game sometimes. You know, as long as you got your paddle in the water, you're gonna stay okay. You know. 
And because again, it's shallow. So even if you try to flip, you're going to hit the bottom. So, you know, you're not going to go anywhere. It's a, it's a pretty safe river at 50 to 60 volume. Interestingly enough, though, when I, when I was showing the uh, the uh, flow profiles, um, the flow does pick up again around October, November. Mm. And uh, if anyone was really brave and adventurous to try and get it, uh, get up there that season, I'd love to find out what it's like. It's going to be cold. It'll probably be snowy. Mm. Um, I don't know whether the road getting there is navigable at that time. But if you can find a way to get in, I think it'd be a pretty fantastic trip. Yeah, we had one situation on our trip in 2019. Um, there was a group of, um, I think, three or two canoes, or maybe one canoe with three people in it. And it was um, a regular fiberglass canoe. We caught the, up to them within a couple K at Bonavent. We didn't know they were there. We caught up to them and they were basically like 20 something two guys and a girl and you know you could smell they were drinking and whatever i don't know how they made it down that part because i would have said the canoe would have been trashed so i never know what happened to those people but that's a classic example of somebody going in with you know no experience the wrong boat because you're going to be pinballing all through these rocks there's no way a, a regular canoe will get through that like a fiberglass kevlar canoe so that was the only thing I do agree. There are some amateurs on the river and that and those were three of them. Never saw them again after we passed them because, you know, we were going at a moderate pace and who knows where they were going. But I would say most people that have, you know, the right gear and the right equipment, there's no issue. It's a, it's a pretty friendly river. I, I, I've got a question here, um, Robert. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Um, uh, on the political side of things, do you do you feel that uh, paddlers will be? Do do you think things will smooth out and paddlers will be more welcome as the years go by? I I know it's been on my list, uh, the Bonaventure, for sure. Um, but now I'm at a point where I think I got to wait for my kids to come along. Um, so maybe in the next two years or so. Um, but I, I've, I've heard about this friction that happened between paddlers and fishermen. Um, just curious if you think it'll smooth out. My, my, my guess is yes. Um, and the reason I say that is that the problem before was that Sim was, was offering this trip, um, but they weren't really vetting the people that were doing it. They just said, okay, if you think you're, you're able, we'll, we'll provide the services. Um, with them, them no longer being in the game, people don't really know about Eskimer, and the only people that will find out about it are the people who are actively looking for the opportunity. So these are the people that are going to have the experience and skill levels to be able to handle it properly. So the, they're going to start seeing a significant reduction in the amount of um, uh, people coming through without proper gear and, and, and experience, and they won't they won't have the same sort of numbers of um, uh, people coming through in carnage and people asking them for help and support and, you know, and all these kinds of things. Um, and the other, and the other tradition too, is that the people who are doing paddling, like a, like a lot of sort of outdoor adventures, frankly, we're a bunch of very relaxed, easygoing, laid back folk. Um, we're not tourists, we're, we're travelers, you know, for the most part. Um, which means that when we see the people on the river, we're, we're going to be friendly. We're going to say hi, we're going to, you know, cheer them on and, you know, and 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 being a good ambassador to the for the for the sport and for the river, it really goes a long way. And I think we'll see a lot uh, a lot of the same people who enjoy the river, but a lot less of the sort of inexperienced yahoos that are that are that that that, that just see a see an opportunity for adventure and kind of coming through there. So I think it'll get better, but it takes time. You know, attitudes are going to change. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more question, Robert. Uh, sure. You talked about uh, an alternative uh, using the Zek for mm -hmm. uh, the uh, shuttle. Is that uh, not officially through the Zek, but a private person yes. uh, who, who was willing to do it? Um, when I contacted Zek, 
um uh the woman who responded like uh, i don't know whether she is she works in the in the office there or she's a receptionist or exactly what she is uh she said she would inquire um and next time when she got back to me uh she finally admitted that yes it was her husband doing it was willing to do it <laughs> so she convinced her husband to do it and they they, they looked at the what what uh what uh, uh sim was charging which at the time was somewhere around eight or nine hundred actually it was 150 bucks per person yeah. Uh, so they said, okay, well, you got six people, we'll charge you, uh, got 900 bucks and, and we'll do it for you. Um, which was possible, but I, I, I opted for Eskimo, as I mentioned before, because I, I wanted to see the development of a more reliable commercial service in there. And if that could sort of help the local small business, I was really happy to do it. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Robert. Did, Any other questions? Yeah, did you um, did you hike those from cabin to cabin on the um, extension of the Appalachian Trail there yourself, or um, uh, when when I went in there, the pictures that I just showed were from were from that area. They, uh, uh, we did a day hike up uh, Mount Zalibu, okay. um, and but I have been there in the past. Um, I've hiked, I've hiked, actually, I haven't really hiked there in the summer, but I've been skiing there three times in the winter and I've done some one, uh, two, six day tours in there and one uh, 10 day tour. Huh. Well. But yeah, cabins, cabins are beautiful. Um, they're, they're not, they're not, well, okay. My, my experience from skiing there uh is dates from probably a little over 20 years ago um i have i have a, I have a little bit of experience there i was actually the first person ever evacuated out of there by snowmobile um but that's that's a story for another day and i get around a campfire <laughs> okay the next zoom call <laughs> <laughs> people like carnage videos and medical evacuation they love those <laughs> <laughs> i got stories Okay, well, we'll save that one for another day. So um, thanks very much, Robert. Um, if anybody missed the beginning because they came in late or whatever, this is recorded and we'll post it on YouTube in a few days. Um, I guess that's it. Uh, I guess, Robert, um, if you can actually send me your um, PowerPoint, uh, because it got cropped a little bit, I'll stick it in the chat as you know photographs, and people can always look at that sure. and do a screen capture of a that. map or something. You know, uh, I say that. You know, I'll just put the not the pictures, but the words that got cropped or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. That would be great. And, and and if anybody has additional questions or you're planning or planning a trip or thinking about planning a trip, uh, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to share whatever whatever information that I, I can. Uh, pictures and I'll walk you through whatever you need to do in the maps and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so basically you, to, you, you, on you, the you, website, you contact info and then one of us on the executive will get it and then we'll connect the dots between Robert and you, yourself, basically. One of the benefits of being a member, you can talk to other members who have all the insight. <laughs> all right, thanks very much, Robert. Okay. <laughs> Let me enjoy. All right. We'll sign off now. Yep. Since we had some um, image issues with uh, presenting the PowerPoint, uh, I've added in here a couple of the slides that um, got cropped off. And you could uh, pause the video and, you know, refer to them as required. Ideal volume flow is about 50 to 60 cubic meters.